All right, folks. So now that we know how to process 10 terabytes of data in 40 seconds, we know the MapReduce is pretty easy. Um, what can be a lot more difficult than I think is a very common problem that people run into writing MapReduce jobs is how do you get the data into the system? And then, of course, how do you get the data out of the system? Um, and I'm about to describe an anti-pattern, which of course includes the right way to do it. Now let's see if this works for me. No! <laughs> <laughs> Because of the angle. It was the angle. All right, I'll the try. The angle. Uh, That's what she okay. said. <laughs> wow, we got a joker in the front row. <laughs> All right, so here's a real world problem, a contrived real world problem, but something that could possibly be a real world problem. <laughs> Where we want to reach out to our publishers in different traffic tiers to notify them of some features that they might be able to use. So we need to look at two different data sources. We need to look at our Salesforce <laughs> contact data to get their email addresses. And we need to look at our pixel log data from our edge systems in order to determine what traffic tier they're in. You know, we have to count their traffic. Um, the details of all this stuff are not that important, but the fact that we need to join these two data sources, that gets interesting. This is the wrong way to do it. You, you write a single MapReduce job, and the first thing that it does is it goes out and it connects to you know, a Salesforce database, and it connects to every single edge data, cert, you know, your servers on the edge, and downloads all the data, writes them out to files, reads through them, processes them. And then you find a bug halfway through running, and you go, oh, shit. I'm going to rerun this whole job. And what you also rerun is the download process from MySQL, or from Salesforce in this case, but from Salesforce and your entire edge system. Um, now, for the rest of this, I'm going to walk through kind of some solutions that we've come up with to not do this, some consistent, <laughs> clean solutions to do this in a, in a more scalable way. There we go. So our pixel logs tend to be very large. Uh, it's about 20 terabytes a day. There we go. I have to turn this way. 20 terabytes a day of raw data, uncompressed data, um, distributed across the world. You know, we have currently 18 different points of presence. And we have to know that when we're looking at this data, it's really accurate. Like if we say we need all the pixel records that came in before this exact millisecond timestamp, we have to be able to do that correctly. So in order to pull that data into the data center in a, in a useful way, we've created something called Whipsaw. Crispin, you here? He's the man. <laughs> uh, so the way this works, you know, we have we 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 have this, you know, simple 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 architecture. We have a central system right here, and it basically connects to each of our remote data centers, and sucks all that data down and stores it in a consistent place in our Quantcast file system, which we sort of touched on a little bit before, but it's. Um, uh, optimized version of the Cosmos file system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the features of this. Yeah, it's highly available. The central server can restart any time without losing any kind of data, uh, without losing log files, without losing you know, partial downloads. Um, monitoring sort of restart procedures. So we'll monitor the central server. If it goes down, you just restart it. Simple enough. Um, and because there could be some few seconds of downtime, clients just ask again. Um, and the thing that they ask again for is, is the data for this date that I'm looking for up to date right now? <coughs> the Pixel machines, we have them maintain their own state. Now, these are the machines. It's, uh, work this time. So these are the machines that we have out in these data centers. So in each of these data centers, you know, we have a bunch of machines. 
they each know exactly which log files they've generated. And so when the central system is asking for those things, they can report and say, oh yeah, here, I've got four files that you've yet to download, and here are their timestamps. Um, this makes it really simple because none of these machines, the files on these guys are on disk, so there's no, there's no lossiness there. This guy keeps it all in memory and could just go back and ask them. So anybody can go down at any time without losing data. Ah. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm happy about this. Uh, so uh, when there's a restart of the central server, we'll then pull back to them, to every edge machine, and just rebuild that internal state. Um, and we build this API so that, so that client jobs can ask and just go back and say, hey, are the jobs, are, is every single pixel that we received before this time already been downloaded to our, in, you know, to our distributed file system? It just, it's a simple thing, a zero or one, but ends up being quite useful. Uh, Salesforce is another system we use as, a, as an external source of information. Um, here are some of the major problems with Salesforce. It's terribly unreliable. They shut this thing down. I don't know. It seems like about every 45 minutes for 15 <laughs> minutes of maintenance. Um, I hope none of you guys work for Salesforce. If you do, we're hiring. Uh, <laughs> It's got a fairly cumbersome API. It's SOAP, you know, which Java takes care of some of the details for. But SOQL is this ugly SQL-like language with no joins and only subqueries. It's, it's, not, it's not beautiful. And it has to be available you know, sort of at all times, because if you need to run a job, which is effectively a query with a join in on our, on our you know, file in our internal cluster, if this is down, and you can't access the data, then you can't run those kind of jobs. Um, so we have to have some data available in order to do any of this stuff. Um, it is the angle. All right. So we built a system called Sherpa, and if you notice, there's a fairly consistent architecture here, which is really, you know, this is the, this is the, point, this is the point of this whole thing. Like these, this architecture, it's straightforward, but it will really save you a lot of time in developing large scale, large scale data system, with working with large scale data systems, which require reliability, which require availability, and which you don't want to screw around with too much to make them to you know, make these things too hard to do. Um, so basically, we have this thing called Sherpa, which manages basically different queries against our Salesforce system. So you know, we can look for different accounts, or maybe you want to find all the contacts, or maybe you want to do some much more complex query, arbitrarily many of these things. And we'll just pull them back to our internal file system and store them there. Um, We'll talk a little bit about more, more about that, but I mean, the, the real point of this is if you have <coughs> heterogeneous data systems in your <coughs> MapReduce architecture, come up with some way to get all the data onto the you know, HDFS, if that's what you're using. Get the data there, because it makes your systems a lot easier to, to work with. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so some of the nice features of this thing, new data is recorded only when the old data is out of date. So you know, we'll basically <coughs> pull it back into the system using either some arbitrary trigger condition or just timing. And we'll update the old data set when we find new data. It's based on open source software, so adding new queries takes about 40 minutes of time. Um, you know, including adding new monitoring and all that nice, nice operational stuff. Um, and available, since this is stored in our own file system and there's some kind of problem, you just use the older, the version that's five minutes older. So this ends up being a really clean system that saves us a lot of 
heartache in developing you know, large-scale systems that have to run at 3 o'clock in the morning and at 4 o'clock in the morning and at 5 o'clock in the morning. Are you doing uh, incremental um, updates, or is it sort of like a wholesale replacement of the existing data source? We are still at this point doing um, wholesale replacement of the old data source just because the sizes are so small that we can just we can afford to download the you know 60 megabytes every five minutes. Well, I have some kind of campaign share for probably to the Calder scoop. Is it fair comparison? I'm sorry, say that again. I see some similarity between Sherpa and Calder scoop. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, yes, there is it's a fair comparison. Yeah, it's a system for sucking yeah, up data. Tell me the advantages, disadvantages. I'm sorry, I've never really, I've never really dug into the deep details of, of the uh, new Cloudera systems. Okay. Like I said, we uh, we have some boundaries around going and, and using the very latest versions of all these nice open source tools. Well, okay. Let me maybe rephrase. Let me rephrase. Ask you a question. Sherpa, is it a single source when you are running? For instance, you have a server dedicated for Sherpa, and Sherpa is waiting through the Chrome Salesforce. Or it could be run from any data node. Is it distributed or centralized? No, no, no. We've, these things are centralized. I mean, I think eventually the, the design for this goes out to being a distributed system, because that's sort of a natural extension of these, of these kind of tools is to go from you know, single, single point of control out to distributed system. Um, but at this point, it's enough to have monitoring and restart capabilities for both of these two systems that pull down enough data fast enough that we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, sorry, go ahead. So for the file, for the file transfer, mm -hmm. you said that each, each file gets transferred. You could potentially tail a file as it goes in. That's not a use case that we typically have, is tailing these files as they come in, because you know, the, the files I'm talking about here are relatively small. Like for the pixel log case, you know, a file might be two, 300 megabytes, and we're getting, I don't know, does somebody have a good estimate on how many files we get a day? 30 to 50,000? Okay. More than that. It's like 15, 20,000 Okay. Um, so, yeah. So you don't really need to tail them. What you want to do, if you actually want to look at a small data set, you just go and look for a single file and you cat it. You know, that's, that's a more common. And for these, for these files that we're pulling down from Salesforce, the data sizes there you know, are less than 100 megabytes. So typically what you'll do is just look at the latest one and just dump it out. Um, Tail may or may not be an interesting use case for us. I guess it depends on your sort of systems that you're working with, whether or not you want to spend the time implementing uh, something where you have some decoding mechanism where you can dump out line by line stuff. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 the important points here are, you know, well, this is a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. Excellent. <laughs> at least in time for questions. Um, the important things, the important things really here is is to use a single mechanism for data access. You know, that's your local distributed file system. Spending a lot of time writing writing jobs that have steps that suck data in from external databases or Salesforce or you know Apache web logs is gonna is gonna be a losing game in the long run. Um, We've learned a lot of hard lessons about trying to pull data in from external data sources, and we've had to come up with tools in order to solve these problems. So if you guys are working with tools to, to solve these problems, this is a good start. Um, and anything from, and really, so anything from an external data source, it should, it should come from a file system. That way, multiple jobs can reuse it. I mean, that's a really nice thing. Decoupling your job from having to understand some external protocol, also a very nice thing. Um, 
and you know, there's a bunch of examples for that. I mean, there's you know, databases with login information that you need, some MySQL thing. There's you know, job configuration data where users can ask you to do something, and then you pull in some instructions, and that's stored in some database behind a Ruby on Rails app. These are all examples that I don't know. Maybe some people have, maybe some people don't, but it's not a bad data access idea. Are there any questions? What open source uh, stuff is Sherpa built on? I don't really want to go into the details of that right now. <laughs> it's open source, though. How is it spelled? How is what spelled? Sherpa? OK. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'll be wandering around if you have questions.